I want to thank you all for being here for our panel on the evolution of war. And for the next 30 minutes, we're going to be answering questions about the role of autonomous weapons, drones, uh, in the future of warfare, how they're going to interact with human beings on the battlefield, what are the challenges that the Pentagon and the mil U.S. military are going to face, what are the ethical dilemmas of using AI in the future of war, and how is war evolving? Um, as, uh, as you've mentioned, we have here Secretary Work, who served as the Deputy Defense Secretary until January of this year. He was appointed by President Obama. He spent 27 years in the U.S. Marines, and he also is a senior fellow at the, at the Center for New American Security. He, has, he serves on the advisory board for Spark Cognition, and he has his own company now, Teamwork, which is looking at the issue of the future of war, and he believes you can transform government through uh, through data science. And Admiral Richardson, thank you for being with us. Um, Admiral Richardson was the Chief of Naval Operations, the 31st CNO. Um, he made history, uh, he retired in August after 37 years of service. And prior to serving as CNO, he was the director of the Navy's nuclear propulsion program, and he's the first Navy head of nukes to be CNO. So thank you both for being with us here today. I want to read to you a few headlines that I saw in the news yesterday, and they have to do with AI. One says, China selling terrifying blowfish killer drones in the Middle East. Pentagon's AI problem is dirty data. Army official, build AI weapons first, then design safety. Before we start, I'd just like to ask a general question. How is war going to change as a result of AI? What do you see as the arc of that change? And what are the challenges that the Pentagon faces? Well, in 2014, 2015, the Department of Defense decided that it needed to try to address the eroding technological superiority that the US Joint Force had enjoyed since the end of the Cold War. And one of the ways that they did so was to go to a variety of different technologists and said, how would you suggest we get out of this problem? And the Defense Science Board said, look, the single most important technology that the department has to master is artificial intelligence. But what people forget is DSB went on to say, it's all about AI-enabled autonomy, autonomous weapons and autonomous operations. The Chinese call this a shift from informationalized warfare to intelligentized warfare. And what you're going to see in the future is ubiquitous digitization, machine-to-machine -machine communications, autonomy at rest where we're using decision support systems, predictive maintenance systems, all sorts of software that helps human makes better, better decisions, and then autonomy in motion. Uh, different unmanned platforms, different unmanned weapon systems, et cetera. The expectation is this is going to result in what the department refers to as algorithmic warfare, and what uh, Amir Hussein and John Allen refer to as hyperwar. It's going to require, or it's going to result in operations that happen at such a fast pace, at machine speeds, that it's going to be extremely violent uh, and extremely difficult to keep up with events unless you are relying upon autonomous AI-enabled systems. So we are in the middle of what I would consider to be a potential revolution in war, and uh, the department is trying to understand what will happen when all of these systems really hit. No, I would say uh, just the same thing. and. Uh uh, one way to think about autonomy in motion and autonomy at rest is to just put it in the context of the OODA loop, right? John Boyd's uh, observe, orient, decide, act. And to me, it all comes down to making uh, uh, better decisions uh, quicker than the adversary. Uh, autonomy in motion, computing at the edge, what we're really doing is we're, we're moving those decisions out and making them automatic out in sensors and payloads. But there's going to be a, uh, also a core role for, uh, for AI at rest to just help uh, people manage the just the tsunami of information that's going to be coming into command centers all the way down and how to make sense of all of that. 
So back to blowfish killer drones. Does the US have these kind of drones? What are the coolest AI-enabled weapon systems that are either currently being used that maybe people don't know about or that are being developed in the Navy, for instance, or elsewhere in the Pentagon? Well, this is an important part of the debate. There's a large uh, movement to ban what are called lethal autonomous weapon systems. But to me, there's three, two general type of weapons that the Department of Defense and all militaries use. Unguided weapons, which are inherently inaccurate. Most of them miss their targets. They're indiscriminate by nature. And then there are guided weapons. And these weapons actively home in on their target by changing their trajectory. And they're far, far more accurate. Lethal autonomous weapon systems, which are what people are arguing about is an entirely new class of weapons that do not exist. Generally what they are, they aren't described this way, but if you listen to what people talk about, they're independent from human control, unsupervised in their battlefield operations, and independently self-targetable. Well, I can guarantee you the Department of Defense does not want weapons like this. No commander is going to just say, hey, let me turn on this weapon and let the weapon decide what it's going to do, when it's going to do, who it's going to kill, how it's going to kill. Um, so it's important to realize there are no weapons like this. They're an entirely new class of weapons. Generally, they would require what the term of art would be artificial general intelligence, intelligence that's much closer to human cognition. And it's not even certain that we're going to be able to get there. And even if we do, it's probably decades. But to answer your question, Jennifer, we have guided munitions with quite advanced autonomous functionalities. So we have weapons, for example, where a human commander would say, there's a group of tanks at 150 nautical miles. I know those tanks are enemy tanks. I want to kill those tanks. And I'm going to fire a guided weapon to a point above the group, and I'm going to delegate to the weapon which target, specific target it picks. The commander has already said, there's 150 tanks I want to kill. He'll shoot out a weapon, and we have weapons that decide, that is the tank I'm going to hit. That's as far as we have gone. And there are some people who think even that's wrong, but we've been using them for over four decades, so it, I think it's a pretty weak argument. So there are no killer robots, in other words. That's a myth that, that you would suggest is not true? The only killer robot I know about is in Terminator Dark Fate. <laughs> and uh, these are generally what people are worried about, about a human, I mean about a machine that's just an implacable killer, completely beyond the uh, control of a human commander. Uh, but you're saying weapons, that is not being developed right now? Not in the West. Now, I haven't seen what the Blowfish drone does. I have read uh, the same articles that you have. Uh, Describe what you've seen. That evidently they're autonomous and can decide what targets to attack and how to attack them. But I don't know what their modalities are and I don't know exactly what the commander, I mean a commander would do. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little reluctant to say, oh my gosh, the Chinese have gone into this area. Mm -hmm. I'm just not certain. And you can appreciate right away that uh, Something like that, very susceptible to deception, very susceptible to being just, you know, taken off of track. And so you know, we're talking about some s unbelievable sophisticated AI to be able to peer through all that. So tell me more about some of the Navy AI-enabled weapon systems that you're seeing. What are some of the coolest things being Well, we're being just developed? getting into it, and we're mov moving uh, towards autonomy. And so there's a whole family of unmanned systems, both in the air, on the surface of the water, and then under the water. Uh, we're using AI to integrate them into uh, sort of uh, the, uh, in fact, we work pretty closely together on this, mm -hmm. an unmanned uh, aircraft to tank other uh, aircraft. integrating, refuel. Yeah, refuel them, uh, integrating it into the manned un air wing, so how to do that. Uh, on the surface, working in areas where uh, we can uh, extend the reach of manned ships and also do kind of adaptive deception, those sorts of things. And then a family of uh, undersea vehicles operating autonomously as well. And they're actually operating now? Or they yeah, are Yeah, we're starting to get into that, so yeah. they're operating now, yeah. yeah. 
But Jennifer, if I could, mm -hmm. you know, it's important that this break between guided munitions with autonomous functionalities and these truly autonomous weapon systems. The entire debate is fraught with ethical, moral, and legal issues. And the department is doing everything it can to understand the objections from those who think these are unethical or immoral or illegal under the laws of armed conflict or international humanitarian law. The Defense Innovation Board just came out with a principle for AI, AI ethical principles. So the one thing I just want everyone to understand is the department wants to have more autonomy and it will have more autonomy. But as it goes along this path, it's trying to do everything it can to be as ethical and moral and obviously legal as possible. So you wouldn't be an advocate for the build the uh, AI weapon and then worry about safety later? No, no, no. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Who is that army official? Probably isn't going to have a job tomorrow. <laughs> uh, maybe you could help us understand how AI is already being used by the warfighter to minimize civilian casualties because I think there is this misunderstanding that if you have AI uh, autonomous weapons that it's increasing civilian casualties but how is it that it actually is being used or can be used to minimize those casualties? I'll tell you one is uh, and I, I think uh, General Thomas might have touched on this yesterday was you can use AI to uh, sift through a, a very complicated battle space, if you will, find your target uh, down to an individual if you need to or a, a specific thing. And then with the precision uh, munition, get right to that thing. And so, you know, consistent with the, the, the discussion so far, a, a tremendous amount of work goes into doing exactly that analysis so that the uh, collateral damage, the civilian casualties are absolutely driven to the absolute minimum uh, before we launch any of these attacks. Yeah, I mean, this is, to me, this is a natural evolution from unguided weapons, which are inherently indiscriminate and cause a lot of collateral damage. All you got to do is look at the pictures of the cities around a factory in World War II. And the city is as bombed out as the factory because most of the unguided weapons miss their targets. The United States has shifted and uses guided weapons predominantly in its operations, from long-range attack to short-range attack. And that has resulted in much less collateral damage and far fewer um, non-combatants harmed. In fact, in uh, 2018, the United Nations looked at the way the United States targets guided munitions. They have to be precisely targeted to utilize their uh, accuracy. So the targeting process, uh, the accuracy of the weapons, if we have a mistake which results in collateral damage or God forbid the death of a non-combatant, there's an immediate investigation. There are lawyers at every single step that say yes the shot that you're going to take is consistent with the laws of war. And the United Nations looked at the way the United States does this and says, look, this is pretty much best practices. As John said, we believe the move to more uh, autonomous weapon, uh, weapons with autonomous functionalities uh, with very high AI systems in it, it's going to be even more discreet and be even less collateral damage and be, have even fewer uh, non-combatant deaths. So, to anyone who thinks that this is an inhumane way to go, I would just say, ask the United Nations. They've said the shift to guided munitions w has resulted in a much more humane outcome on the battlefield, and the Department of Defense is trying to make the uh, case that we would make another step. So do you think that those Google workers who signed the petition and said they wouldn't work with DOD on the kind of software programs that would help these, these autonomous weapons be smarter, are they misguided? Has the Pentagon been able to convince tech, and we're here in Austin, have they been able to convince tech companies to work with them? I would say that uh, one thing that if you go back and you sort of adopt the uh, 
stance that we're in a competition, a great power competition. Uh, we have, as a nation, we have never prevailed in a great power competition without a close relationship between the department and academia, the universities, research institutes, and those sorts of things. And I think in the last 20 years, and Secretary, where you can uh, check me if I've got this wrong, but there's been a little bit of a drifting apart, right? And so I don't know that, uh, uh, we just don't understand each other, perhaps, as well as we used to and as well as we should, if we're really gonna be competitive in this, uh, in this competition going forward. So not only, and, and then of course, all of those, those students graduate and then they join all these tech companies, mm -hmm. right? All the, the real talent. So that familiarity can extend into industry and, and the tech companies as well. But I've been advocating for just a, a more habitual, closer relationship so that we get to know each other better, right? And then we can stop sort of stereotyping mm -hmm. on either side. And in terms of uh, great power competition, Russia, China, what are Russia and China doing in terms of autonomous weapon systems, in terms of looking at future battlefields that the U.S. is not doing? Is the U.S. still a world leader? Is it possibly going to slip back and not be a world e leader in these areas if there isn't more collaboration with the tech community? Yes. Um, I'm on the National Security Commission for Artificial Intelligence, which was empowered by Congress to take a look at this very issue. Uh, China has probably the most ambitious national AI strategy uh, because they believe it is a means by which they will leapfrog the United States both in economic output as well as military power. Um, they want to surpass the United States in AI technologies by 2025 and they want to be the world leader in 2030. The Russians have a goal to have many, many more robotic units. To me, it's a pretty simple problem for Russia. Their, demo, uh, their, their demographics are terrible. They're running out of people to enlist in their armed forces, so they're much more inclined to use robotics, and they have actually been testing robotics in Syria. So both China and Russia have said, this is a competition we want to go directly against the United States. This is a way that we can level the playing field if we ever did, God forbid, come to blows. Um, and this is going to require a national response. Uh, for the Chinese, their Sputnik moment was in 2014 when Lee Sedol was defeated by AlphaGo in the game of Go. Uh, it shook up the entire country in China. Explain that a little bit. Um, Go is a very, very, unlike chess, I can't remember how many pieces, I think 180 pieces, there's like 200, and, I'm making these numbers up, but <laughs> you know, 180 pieces on a board, you're trying to uh, make it so that your opponent can't move, uh, and there's millions, millions and millions of different uh, ways you could actually play. And uh, AlphaGo was an AI that played against a grandmaster in Go. And it was widely accepted that, hey, look, this is just too complicated of a game for AI to beat a human. Uh, and it beat the human four to one. Mm. The humans won one, raw <laughs> humans. Um, and for the Chinese, uh, Go is central to their strategic culture and thinking in warfare. And they said, whoa, we're going to have to do something about this took them in the direction much more than the United States is right now in command and control systems. Uh, so their autonomy at rest really is focused on command and control systems and autonomy in motion, as you said, they're developing an awful lot of unmanned systems and unmanned weapons, autonomous weapons. And I, I, I like the way you also alluded to the fact that uh, AI applied certainly to kind of the military dimension of national power, but also across the board, the economic dimension of national, I mean, the competition is going to manifest itself along all of those things, uh, information, uh, diplomacy, economics, and also military. And so it's going to be decisive uh, across every dimension of national power in this competition. I think that there's uh, both risk and opportunity there. If we can use AI to manage our way through this competition without getting into conflict, which as uh, Secretary Work said, is going to be 
you know, violent on a, on a scale we haven't seen before. What were some of the surprising moments that you saw as CNO or wh when you were based out in the Pacific in terms of advances that China or Russia were making in terms of AI? Well, just uh, the scale of it all. So it's uh, difficult to get specific insights into kind of their progress in AI, but they've, you know, I've obviously focused most on the Navy, and they've re completely rebuilt their Navy in a matter of 10 years, right? And so, uh, and it's sort of natural. We had this moment as a nation kind of at the end of the 1800s where if we were going to continue to prosper, we had to go offshore, overseas markets, access sea lanes, all of that and we built a Navy to kind of step up to that strategic challenge. I think China in many ways is uh, getting into the maritime domain to continue to prosper as a nation, and so they're seeing their uh, military adapt to that as well. Given your nuclear background, um, let's talk about AI for nukes. Could we see a situation where uh, humans would be taken out of nuclear decision making? Would we ever have a moment where you got rid of the nuclear football, for instance? Right. Uh, I was nuclear propulsion, right? So <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. I'll take fair enough, but... I don't think we would want just a secretary yes. work. Say, this is the one area where we just cannot automate that, right? Okay. And so, uh, and there's been a number of uh, books and close calls and all of those sorts of things where a, a person stepped in at, at, you know, kind of the last minute and, and made the right call. Yeah, I think the whole debate on lethal autonomous weapon systems generally kind of focuses in on the weapon, not weapon systems. I tend to think of these as lethal intelligent machines and the autonomy at rest part are command and control systems that can make a decision for a preemptive or retaliatory attack without human intervention. That is extraordinarily, uh, that would lead to an extraordinary level of crisis instability would increase the chances of an inadvertent war and possibly an inadvertent nuclear exchange. And I believe the United States should do everything it, it can to prevent nations, especially those with nuclear weapons, to go after those type of machines. Now, there's a much, much different debate to have over the autonomous weapons. Uh, but I don't want to, you know, to answer your question, I know of no talk inside the Department of Defense that says we would automate a retaliatory or a preemptive weapon system uh, without a human in the either in or on the loop. You know, Jennifer, we're also learning uh, not only a, a tremendous amount about artificial intelligence and how that can aid, aid decision making, but also on the human side. You know, we're learning a lot about how our brains work and these, these biases uh, uh, that are inherent in us. So, you know, and uh, so the, you know, the partnering of uh, artificial intelligence with this new knowledge of uh, kind of the strengths and vulnerabilities of human intelligence and decision making, I think that is really fertile ground for coming up with a system that is, uh, you know, partners together and makes it uh, kind of one plus one equals three. This is a really important point because the department is not trying to go for AI that is always perfect. Mm -hmm. The department recognizes that AI will make mistakes like humans do. The best picture I've ever seen is that one picture in the game against the Saints and the Rams. And the referee is actually looking at the collision yes. of the defensive back with the receiver. And he made what was clearly the wrong decision. And we don't say, my God, you know, how could that have, you know, well, we do say, how could that have happened? <laughs> yes. A lot of people actually <laughs> Depending do on which side you're on, yeah. But the way, uh, you know, the department thinks of AI as uh, autonomy is it's the programmed ability of machine to make faster decisions as well as or better than a human. How do you take the bias out? It's going to be a lot of testing. You're going to have to go through a verification and validation regime. Uh, you can take the bias out, but we're learning. I think that's one of the things. DARPA spends a lot of money on trying to get explainable AI, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. But this point on as well as humans, this is what happened in the intelligence community. In 2015, for the first time, computers could identify an object in a scene 
as well as a human analyst. So generally, I'm, these numbers are close, but they're not uh, precise. A human was 95% accurate. And the computer vision was 95.4% accurate. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like it was a slam dunk. It was as good as an analyst. And that's when the intelligence community started to move towards computer vision. Uh, Have they shifted over completely? Not completely, but they're well, well along. Yeah. Um, so, uh, like I said, you're never going to get perfect decision making in war, whether it's a man or a machine. What you try to do is have a command and control system that uh, tries to ameliorate bad decisions. And, and to the point, you know, obviously humans, uh, we've got biases and vulnerabilities as well. There have been two Nobel Prizes in behavioral economics to just sort of try and explain why we make decisions that are not in our best interests, right, mm -hmm. people. And so the, uh, that's where the teaming can come into effect, where perhaps an AI type of uh, first step can serve to check some of those biases. And so in some of these tournaments, so you mentioned chess and go, you know, uh, obviously uh, computers have been, uh, you know, beat uh, the chess grandmaster some time ago, well before the alpha go. And so what do you do? Is it over? You know, do we stop playing chess tournaments and that sort of thing? And, and the answer was no. But some of the tournaments have been with teams of grandmasters and computers. And it, the winners are not necessarily the team of the best grandmasters and the best computers. It's the, it's the teaming effect that's most effective. The integration. And yeah, exactly. And yeah. so this, I think, is a real rich area. We only have a minute left, but I just wondered if each of you could leave the audience with something to think about in terms of this topic or an action to take. I wasn't here yesterday, but I understand Tony Thomas said, wow, he thought we were, the department was behind mm -hmm. and we didn't go as fast. I totally agree with him. Uh, I consider us to have lost two years. We had a strategy, the national defense strategy listed advanced autonomous systems artificial intelligence and machine learning as one of the top key priorities. Um, but it took so long to stand up the Joint AI Center. The Joint AI Center was put under the CIO rather than the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. You can debate why that was, but the bottom line is there was no clear signal from the top that we were gonna go after an AI-enabled future and the programs had better reflect it, and we will shift money that way. That is changing now. Secretary Esper announced in his confirmation hearing, as well as at the National Security uh, Commission on AI, uh, that AI was his number one R&D priority. Money is now being shifted into the Jake. So I anticipate that you'll see an acceleration of departmental efforts, which I think is going to be really, really good. I would say that uh, while I agree with 100% with what Secretary Work said, there is tremendous opportunity for private industry to help the department get moving in this area at the speed that we need to move. Uh, you know, the government is is a big flywheel. It takes a while to get spinning. Once it spins, it's it's pretty effective. But in terms of, I, I would just encourage uh, everybody to be bold. Come to the discussion with solutions, come and ready to go. And I think that the uh, climate is that they'll invest in those solutions. Great. Thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you to our audience. And we'll, we'll be back in a moment. Thank you. <laughs>